I gave this presentation at our SORAX meeting on uh, April 5th and the recording in Jitsi didn't work properly so I thought I would uh, use my screen capture software here and uh, redo the presentation because I thought it was fairly important because this is a very powerful tool and uh, hopefully someone else may build this and if so then I think this presentation would be very helpful for them. And this project, I started this project, geez, uh, well before COVID. So I've been at this project for uh, three, four years now. And uh, it's been a frustrating project and tons of mistakes I've made. I keep finding errors and even this presentation I corrected errors in it up to a few days ago. So and I've, I've put some quotes here, a couple of famous people who were okay with making mistakes and uh, persevered even though they made lots of mistakes. So I'm in uh, good company. So one of the reasons I, um, I'm doing this presentation in this mode, I can always go into, you know, presentation mode and do this uh, uh, presentation but I don't like doing that I like having the slides here so I could see what I'm doing and so the um, what's a transistor tracer why do you need this and I've listed some questions here some issues which a transistor tracer could help you uh, identify but basically if you're designing your own amplifiers or you're looking to replace a transistor with another transistor or you need to understand what the underlying, you know, um, uh, uh, parameters around a transistor are, then you, you need a transistor tracer. If you're just building a Hans Summers kit or a, you know, a micro bit X, and you're just plugging in transistors with all the biasing and the network of the resistors around it, you don't really need a transistor tracer because that's been done for you. Uh, you know, Farhand or Hans Summers, when they design a kit, they do all that for you, so you don't really need this. So here's what I'm going to be talking about. It's I'm going to be talking about the uh, transistor tracer version 1. There's two versions of it. Uh, this is about version 1. Version 2, I'm currently testing uh, right now. So I'll introduce the version 1 hardware. I'll also talk about the, um, the program that you need to do a plot. I, I opted not to put like a TFT display on this uh, project uh, where it would show the plots because uh, good luck reading that on a tiny small screen. You need something larger. So I wrote a little program in Python that allows you to display the um, charts. And uh, what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to spend a bulk of the time uh, just going through some various uh, curves of several transistors and MOSFETs. And I'm just going to be showing you what it spits out uh, and how it compares to the data sheets. And this is not going to be a tutorial. I'm going to introduce some of the, or summarize some of the terms and some of the concepts around uh, transistors, MOSFETs, but it's not a tutorial. Later in the uh, presentation, I've got a set of uh, tutorial videos which you could go back and take a look at. So I'm not going to explain what VBE, VCE, VDS is and so forth. Uh, you're expected to know what those are and if you need to understand what, what they are, uh, I've got some tutorials uh, listed. So here's the, the evolution of the transistor tracer. Here I started out uh, with a uh, STM32 board and uh, I had a couple of breadboards and I, a lot of the parts have pulled off of this. It just is just showing basically a bunch of wires and uh, some pots here, but I've uh, basically removed a, a lot of the uh, components. The problem with this version was the STM32's uh, 3.3 uh, 3 volt uh, uh, microprocessor or microcontroller. So, you know, digital outputs were limited to 3.3 .3 volts and analog inputs were limited to 3.3 .3 volts. 
So I went to another version here, which I use the Arduino Nano, which is a 5 volt uh, microcontroller. And you could see here, I've, it's a mess of wires. But this board, I was success. Uh, I had success in um, uh, characterizing both uh, PNPs and NPNs, as well as PMOSs and NMOSs. And if you kind of look in the corner here, you will see a set of dip switches here. And those dip switches I would use to select the inputs to select the uh, uh, NPN uh, sockets or select the PNP sockets because PNP is quite different when you trace it. It's like uh, negating a uh, NPN uh, transistor, you know, taking the mirror image of it and doing a trace with that. So what I did was I, I took that and I, I created a MILDA board, uh, board out using a CNC and I dropped the PNP and the P-channel functionality and I just focused on NPN. And uh, you could see the, uh, the Arduino Nano here and uh, the sockets that I would put the various transistors in. And, um, this board works and this presentation was going to be showing you traces from this board. As I was doing this um, presentation, putting it uh, together, I sent away to have some boards done and uh, this board has since arrived. It's the version 1 PCB. I had JLC PCB uh, create this board and I've given the board to a couple colleagues, uh, Alan and Wayne, to go and um, build and test uh, for me and if it works as uh, expected then it's probably going to make its way down to uh, Dayton uh, next month in May. So how this works it's pretty straightforward there's no rocket science to it so basically if you've got your transistor under test uh, your NPN or your MOSFET you know BJT or MOSFET here um, you have a resistor here in the drain collector or you have another resistor here in the base gate and you monitor you measure the voltage before the resistor after the the resistor using the Arduino's uh, ADC and by doing that I can measure the current so then I can get the base uh, current likewise I could do the same thing here I can measure the uh, collector current since the emitter is grounded, the uh, collector current plus the base current is equal to the emitter current. So you'll see a lot of people say the collector current is approximately equal to the uh, uh, emitter current. Now because, you know, I'm dealing with VCC here, which could be 12, 14 volts, I can't feed 12 volts to the ADC. I would fry it. I would fry the uh, Arduino. So what I had to do was put uh, several pots in here and they're basically just a voltage divider. The voltage comes in from the uh, connection, either one of these connections here, feeds in and then I've got the wiper, I can adjust what voltage I get. So uh, these pots are set up so if 14 volts is fed here, I get a maximum of uh, 5 volts coming out. That way I can't damage the Arduino's uh, ADC. Here's a schematic of the um, version 1. Uh, the Arduino's here, the Nano's here, uh, the base is controlled by this pin here. So I've got a pulse with, uh, one of the things I guess I should have mentioned here is that the way I generate the voltages, analog voltages here, because the Arduino cannot generate uh, analog uh, voltages, is I'm um, using a pulse width a modulated signal and I'm putting that through a low pass filter and I get a DC output with, uh, with very low ripple and I'm set it to run at uh, approximately 31 kilohertz. And so based on that I get an analog uh, voltage coming out here and that voltage is what I fed a feed to the base. I take that voltage and I amplify that voltage to get it up to close as possible to VCC and I feed the collector with that. So you can see here um, the base, here's the pulse width modulation uh, voltage uh, 
conversion here, which is taking the PWM and converting it to a DC. So I got a DC signal coming out here. This is fed to a pot, goes to an ADC. The schematic says 462, uh, says 10K, it's not 10K, it's 462 ohms here. The same thing, uh, after the uh, resistor, I've got another pot and another ADC, and that goes to the, to the base of the gate of the transistor under test. Same thing for the collector. I've got the pulse width um, to DC circuit here. However, that's feeding to an LM358 op amp that's going to amplify that DC voltage up. And then it's going to uh, have a TIP120 uh, Darlington transistor here. So basically, uh, this is in a, uh, a common uh, emitter or, or common collector configuration. So the v, VE here mirrors what VB is. So I have to amplify this up to, uh, you know, as close as possible to 12 volts or VCC. So I get 12 volts or so out, output here with the drop of, a, you know, about uh, a volt or so drop. That goes through a set of resistors. I can select to limit how much current is going to be fed into the device under test and I'm measuring the voltage before the resistor and the voltage after the resistor using ADCs and I can determine the current going through those resistors. So here's the speeds and feeds. This is what uh, this version 1 can basically do. It can do any NPN BJTs with this footprint and I found this these footprints here will do almost every type of uh, uh, BJTs, at least I have, on, st uh, on hand. And as well as NMOS, same thing the, with these footprints here. And that's basically just these sockets I've got here. They just, uh, they're wired up to facilitate those footprints. With a VCC of 14 volts, the maximum um, voltage you could supply to the collector is 11 volts. So you're dropping almost 3 volts and maximum is about 900 uh, milliamps, so just under an amp maximum you could deliver through the, uh, deliver to the collector. Likewise for the base, uh, because it's just a pulse width modulation signal coming out of the Arduino, maximum voltage you get is about, about 4.3 volts and uh, a maximum current is about 7 milliamps. So these are what restricts what you can uh, go and uh, uh, characterize with. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the PC Python uh, console that I wrote. It's uh, written in uh, Python and I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about this but basically I had to build this program so that I could generate the charts. So I built this very very generic. Um, so what it basically does it takes any data that's coming out of a microcontroller it doesn't have to be a transistor tracer. It could be any, it's a generic program. It takes any data out. And as long as the data has a number sign at the start of the line, it's going to capture that data. And once you have a pipe symbol at the end to say plot it, it'll then plot it. That's it. And if you do series, you can separate your series with the equal uh, qualifier. And so basically it can do an XY chart where this is X, that's Y, and it can do what I call a series XY. So it's basically an XY chart, but each line here corresponds to a series. And the series are denoted here. So in this specific case, you know, each one of these series is uh, IB, or in the case of MOSFET, VGS. So here I just talk about, uh, you know, the program, you have to um, have it in Python, you'll have to have Python installed, you'll have to have all the uh, libraries installed within Python. I've also created an exe, which you can just uh, run the exe. The exe is uh, um, .ex underscore, and uh, you can't download an exe file. Uh, to your PC because usually most browsers will stop it. That's why it's renamed. And by the way, this program is on GitHub. You can go to my GitHub repository 
and uh, the uh, Python code and everything is there. So when you start up the program, this is what you get. There's a spot where you put in commands, uh, CLI commands. Uh, it tells you what serial ports are available and you select the serial port, the baud rate, you connect and away you go. Then once you're connected, you get a message saying connected. You're now talking to the microcontroller. So you could put your commands in here if you've got a CLI, a command line interface. Um, you can enter your commands, hit the en enter button, and it sends it to the uh, um, um, microcontroller. And you could either you could save your data to a CSV file, or you could plot it, or you could do both. You select the plot, you hit go, and it generates the plot. So how does this program work? Very, very, very simple. I made it very, very generic so that it can work with any microcontroller. Basically. You just get your microcontroller to spit out numbers. And that number has to have the number sign in front of it. And once the program sees a number sign in front of two numbers, it captures it and it puts it into an array. And you can see here each one of the numbers, it captures each number and it puts it into array. So this is the blue is what my program, my Python program generates. The white is what the Arduino uh, generates. So if you weren't using my program, this is what you would see. If you're using my Python program, this is what you would see. The blue text is from my program. The white text is from, coming from the Arduino. When it sees the number sign in two numbers, it captures it. And once it sees the pipe character, it says, okay, done. It's captured the data points. It tells you, you hit the go uh, button and it plots it for you. And for doing what I call a series, X, Y, similar, you have to send three numbers. The first number is the series and then X, Y. So for this series, you generate a bunch of XY, you change the series number, generate another XY and so forth. And each time you change the series number, you just put an equal sign in. You send the program, my program, an equal sign. So here's a little um, video I took of the program in action. It's, it's sped up, it's gonna happen real fast. You see it's red when it's not connected. You select your COM port, board rate, connect, you get green. And this black text is from the Arduino. The blue text is from the uh, uh, um, program, my program. I've managed to put a help uh, in my program. And uh, here I'm generating plots. I select the type of plot. And uh, the Arduino sends my Python program the data. And then I plot it. Now. You don't have to have a CLI. You could have your Arduino, just you hit a button or you turn on your Arduino and something happens and it spits data. As long as that data is formatted with the number sign and um, you know the pipe character, then um, it, it's gonna capture that data. And here it's doing that, uh, you know, the, the, the very common transistor a uh, uh, trace plot that you see, with, you know, VCE versus uh, IC versus um, uh, IB. And this takes a while to generate. Here it's generated it and uh, you hit the go and it generates the plot. Now, this plot looks terrible because I just, this, this presentation, I didn't bother going through and properly characterizing transistors. I just took default parameters. And the increments here between these lines is too large. You could see the increments here, each of these lines, here's, here's the legend. So this is for a MOSFET, this is for a 2N7000 uh, MOSFET, and these are the VGS values. So for each of the VGS, you're getting that. And my step between the VGS values is too big. So if I, you wanted to really do a good job of this, you would select your trace from this line to that line, and you'd create a bunch of other points in between here, and you get a better looking trace. But um, this here, I just want, want, wanted to demonstrate how you generate plots. 
So you get the, the Arduino to spit out your data. You hit the plot to say start capturing. And once it sees that number sign and then the, the two numbers, it captures it. And once it sees the pipe character, it uh, stops and says I've captured 43 points. And so you hit the go and it plots it. And the uh, rest of these are just showing different uh, plots. This is the transconductance trans plot of a MOSFET. And it's going to show you how the transconductance uh, varies with uh, uh, drain voltage. And etc. 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 I've got other ones where you this is uh, it's showing you the RDS on for a um, MOSFET, how it varies uh, with the uh, drain voltage. And once again, this is not meant to to show you all the curves; it's just to show you how my microcontroller program works. So I've included here a CLI manual, which I'm not going to go, th go through, and I, but I just included this because if someone wants to build this, they have to know how to use it. So I put a bunch of slides in here in terms of how you go about uh, building the source and loading it. This is a, a slide showing you how to um, compile this in uh, the Arduino IDE. I use the platform IO to build it. So this is just showing you how to uh, uh, build it within our, uh, the Arduino IDE. This is an interesting slide because I actually uh, built it using the Arduino IDE and it complained that it, there was low memory. And I never got such a warning in the platform I.O. This is, by the way, this is showing the platform I.O. output and this is showing the Arduino IDE output and it's showing the memory utilization. And if you compare what Arduino, using the Arduino IDE, what the memory utilization is uh, versus the platform I.O. Uh, memory utilization, you can see the both for RAM and flash, the Arduino is using far more memory than the platform I.O. So I think the Arduino IDE, it's it's the the firmware, the, the code it generates is very bloated. I don't know, it's adding extra libraries or extra code, who knows? Uh, and it's just bloating uh, the code, whereas platform I.O. does it very, very uh, uh, efficiently. So this is just giving you a summary of the commands. I'm not gonna be going through this. I just put this as a reference this is talking about how the the, uh, the commands you use for calibrating it. This is giving you the build tips, uh, you know, how you go about uh, building version one hardware. This is going through the calibration, how to calibrate it and what uh, defines you need to go and change in the uh, code. And uh, uh, the rest of this is showing you how to do sweeps. This is showing you how to do NPN sweeps, the commands, how to use the commands. Uh, this is for a MOSFET sweeps. Um, this is showing you for a diode sweep, um, how to do a custom sweep. Remember I was saying that, you know, you need to select the range at which you do your sweep. That way you get a much more meaningful plot. This is uh, one way of doing it. Uh, this is another way of, of setting the number of points. This is where you set the voltage, the min-maximum base voltage, min-max collector voltage, and this is the number of data points you're going to set, you're going to collect between the min and max uh, voltages. And this is how you manage the EEPROM because it saves your configuration in EEPROM. And this is general troubleshooting uh, commands that you can use for troubleshooting. So I'm just going to go through uh, some basics around uh, BJT and uh, uh, MOSFETs just so that you understand uh, from a high level what the transistor tracer is measuring. As, a, as I said, this is not a tutorial. If you're looking for a tutorial, I've listed some really good videos here. Uh, Al, W2AEW, has just published this video. It's, I think, maybe two or three weeks old. It's an excellent video. It's a good starting point. 
he goes through you know uh, how an NPN works, how a PNP works, and he shows you the current and beta and all that HFE and all that kind of stuff. He explains that, he demonstrates what that is. Very good uh, video. This is another good uh, source here. It's uh, this guy, uh, uh, Professor uh, Tony uh, Crusoe, Crusoe. Uh, sorry, I butchered his name, but uh, he's got a really good video here and he shows you the plots, some plots here, which I have used the plots he uses, uh, the transistor tracer generates those plots. So, and you'll see uh, I have, I'm generating very similar plots to um, the plots that he describes in his uh, video. Uh, Matteo Aboy really good set of uh, videos that's my go-to place um, by the way Mateo is a man uh, I, I don't know her her name but she does the videos and she does an excellent job um, uh, her name's not listed anywhere I wish I could give her credit but she does an excellent job of explaining BJT amplifiers and the equations and how it works uh, I suspect that she's probably a grad student or maybe a research fellow or maybe a adjunct professor or something, I don't know. Then our, uh, our Professor Fiora here, he, again, really good place to go get some uh, uh, background. I also stumbled across this video here, which is a demo of the uh, some modifications this guy made to the Heathkit transistor tracer. So up until I watched this video, I was generating curves for my various uh, uh, MOSFETs and uh, um, BJTs, and I didn't know whether they were good or wrong or bad or whatever. But looking at the traces that came out of the Heathkit tracer and comparing it to mine, I, I felt a little better because they were very close in just the, the nature uh, of them. The uh, Heathkit is much smoother, cleaner, my traces are a little bit uh, jerky, jumpy, and it's because I'm taking, you know, discrete steps. I'm using a uh, ADC. One important um, term you'll uh, hear me talking about a lot, especially when I talk about uh, MOSFETs, I'm showing you the traces for MOSFETs, is a concept called transconductance. And basically it's a, it's a combination of transfer conductance. So. It's basically what it is in a nutshell. You've got a black box. You have something feeding it. You have a goes in and you've got a goes out. So the trans conductance is telling you how the output is related, related to the input. So it's kind of like a transfer function. It's saying, you know, with the input of this, uh, with this transconductance parameter, you get this output here. And it's uh, very important in MOSFETs. Uh, um, in transistors, it's not used very much. You more see people use this term beta, which is, I guess it is a form of a transconductance, but you'll see beta being used. If you look at a data sheet, they use HFE. I have no idea what HFE stands for, but they use H H HFE. You'll see a lot of people use beta. I don't know if that's beta is new uh, or old school or HFE is old school or new school. I don't know. I use beta. So basically the concept of beta is you've got a small current coming into the base and that creates a humongous current coming out uh, going between the collector to admitter. The relationship between the current going through the output of the transistor going from collector to emitter is related by this beta term. So you feed a small current in, it gets multiplied by beta and you get a large current coming out. And same thing, I'm going to talk about this when I get to the MOSFET slides, but it's the same thing except for MOSFETs you're using voltage. It's not a current, you have a voltage you, you apply to the gate and then the drain source turns on and you get a current coming out. So once you exceed the threshold voltage on the gate, you get a huge current coming out and you have to use this transconductance GM to uh, determine what the output is going to be. And again, if you need a, a better explanation of this, go back to the uh, tutorial slides I've got. So here's some of the classic, uh, you know, 
uh, traces you'll see um, for transistors or MOSFETs. So this is the classic, you know, uh, transistor trace. You see where you're plotting VCE along the bottom and IC uh, vert vertically here. I find this chart very, very confusing. I don't know about you guys. It's very, very confusing. I understand it, but it's very, very confusing because it just, it doesn't make sense. But it does make sense. It's just my understanding of it. So it's showing you the different regions. Uh, this here is the saturation region. This is the active region, cutoff region at the bottom, and this is breakdown region. So the sweet spot is here, is in the active region, and that's where the amplifier, that's where the transistor acts as an amplifier. So if you take this curve and you kind of draw your load line, and that load line is determined by your biasing of that transistor, what resistors you put in the collector or the base, and so forth. So what you're trying to do with this load line is you're trying to make it operate in the active region. You don't want it to go into breakdown or saturation or, or cutoff region. You want it to stay here. That way you get, uh, you get a linear amp amplification. However, there are times where you will bias it, bias your transistor so it goes into cutoff. And that's when you go into these class uh, amplifier classes. Class A is where it's completely in the active region, it's linear. You know, then you got class B, class A, B, class C, and that's where you're amplifying only a portion of the signal. I like this, these charts better than that other chart. Um, this makes so much more sense to me. So remember I said that you feed a small current in, you get a large current coming out, and it's related by this term beta. So that's what this chart here is showing. So as you increase your, your uh, base current, you get a collector current coming out. So this is your collector current axis, this is your base current. So once there's no base current going in, so the PN junction, the base emitter junction is reverse biased. It hasn't hit that 0.7, you know, that magic 0.7 volts to make it uh, forward biased then no current flows through the collector to emitter and you're in cutoff. There is no collector current flowing. But once you get away from that and you get this so that it's uh, forward biased and you get some current flowing here, then you start seeing the current going up as you increase the base current. And it follows this curve. And there's a point where you supply uh, base current at a certain level and it doesn't matter how much more base current you apply the collector current stays the same that is called saturation so the transistor is in saturation it does not amplify it only amplifies here so the uh, collector current is given by beta times IB so now if you take a look at this curve it's it's not a straight line because uh, you know, beta is equal to IC over I, IB should be a straight line, but it's not. It's a curved line. So beta changes. It's not a constant. That's a very, very important concept, and we're going to see that with the traces I generate. Here's another view of looking at the same um, um, uh, uh, biasing, the same uh, operation. But we're looking at voltages here. So I'm looking at VCE along the vertical axis, and I'm looking at VBE along the horizontal axis. So if we look at this model here where the emitter is grounded, there's no resistor, it's grounded. So the base voltage you apply is VBE because it's with respect to ground. The voltage at the base is with respect to ground. Since the emitter is grounded, that is VBE. Okay. Similarly, VCE is from the collector to the emitter, but the emitter is grounded, so it's from the collector to ground. And it turns out VCE is just going to be the output of this uh, little simple amp amplifier. So we've got a resistor here in the collector, and uh, so once there is this junction is reverse biased, there's no current flowing into the, the transistor, no current is flowing through the collector, and so there's no voltage drop across this resistor, so therefore VCE is equal to VCC, and we see that here, where 
until we hit that magic threshold voltage of 0.7 volts here where this uh, junction gets forward biased there is no current flowing so once we get current flowing here there's going to be a voltage drop because VCE here is going to be VCC minus the current times this resistor minus the voltage drop across here so as more current flows through here you get a bigger voltage drop and this value decreases so hence you see the, the voltage here VCE decreasing and it decreases at a very alarming rate but it gets to a point where it doesn't matter what voltage you apply here um, it gets saturated and the current flowing through here remains constant it doesn't change and because the current flowing through here remains constant VCE remains constant and you're at that saturation uh, point of the uh, transition transistor so this is the active region this is where you woohoo woo this is the dull region where you don't get any amplification here's where you get amplification you get a small change in VBE you get a huge change in VCE so this um, I'm gonna start getting into some of the plots now so this is a tool and I learn so much about this every day that I use it it's a tool just like a ohmmeter or a scope if you don't know how to use your volt ohm meter or you don't know how to use your, your scope it's a it's a meaningless tool but once you understand how to use it it's a very powerful tool the same thing with this uh, transistor tracer it's a very powerful tool and you need to understand what you're doing and the following charts are just based on what my limited understanding is and I probably only scratched some of the surface of what this tool can do so here's some of the plots it can generate and uh, notice there's no values labeled here um, my program this is because this is coming out of my Python program I did not want to brand uh, put uh, titles here like beta versus IB because then my Python program becomes only for a transistor tracer but my Python program could be used for anything so I like to just to put generic uh, labels here so you could uh, generate uh, 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 base current versus beta for, for, for the transistor um, same thing except you could look at collector current versus beta here's VBE versus IC for the transistor so you could see where the transistor turns on now in the other plot you, you theoretically we should see this bending over here coming over when it hits saturation and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, um, whether that's uh, from my power supply or from the transistor tracer itself same thing with this trace remember we showed the trace where you know there's no current flowing and all of a sudden VCE starts dropping because currents flowing you should see a leveling out here when it gets to uh, sat saturation we're not seeing that in some of the transistors you start seeing that but that's what that plot is and here's the the money plot that everyone you know looks thinks of when they think of a transistor trace you've got VCE along the bottom I see and for the various values of IB you plot what that looks like and here's the values of IB for each uh, color line and you could uh, you know draw your um, your load line and figure out how to bias your transistor there I added these two new plots um, one is VBE versus RE there's a little internal resistor here and that resistor uh, changes it's it's uh, depends on a whole bunch of things your thermal temperature and a whole bunch of things but it looks as if that does not um, remain constant um, below the threshold voltage it it's fairly large which makes sense because it's large because that emitter uh, the base emitter uh, PN junction there is reverse bias so it's got a very high resistance across it and that's what that's showing there so um, so it can do a VBE versus RE which is that internal intrinsic uh, uh, resistance 
and it can also do a transconductance. You don't see a lot of people using transconductance with a transistor, but it can calculate the transconductance for you as a function of uh, VBE. So now let's have some fun. Let's look at some plots. So here's a diode plot. This is a 1N914. Now to do a diode, you have to do a special jig. You have to put a resistor in. If you don't put that resistor in, you would probably fry the Arduino and you may smoke uh, some of the uh, resistors coming out to may get very hot. So you need to put a resistor here uh, between the uh, uh, where you're going to plug it into the um, uh, slots on the uh, tracer. So this first plot is showing you, you know, the voltage uh, at the um, input of the uh, diode and then you're looking at the current flowing through the diode. So you can see the turn on point. You can see where the diode comes on. This plot be helpful for you to characterize or match your diodes. So this is now showing you the forward voltage drop. So for the uh, 1N914, the forward voltage drop, maximum says it should be about 1 volt. I measured it, uh, it comes out to be about 1.6 volts, so I'm a little bit on, on the high end. But I'm not sure if 0.6 volts makes a huge difference. Uh, who knows, maybe these came from China and they're not as good. Here's for a Zener. This is a 1N752, which is a 5.6 volt Zener. And you can see in the data sheet here, it says it's uh, 5.6 volts. And when I plot, plot it, it comes out 5.6 volts exactly. So that's pretty good. So <laughs> this is a, a moment where, you know, one of my mistakes, one of my many mistakes. So a lot of these plots, I going forward here, I use this transformer, this brick, and uh, it caused me a lot of grief. And uh, you'll see why in a few, but I'll keep referring back. I'm not sure whether it's a limitation of this, because here it's limited to 10 volts. That's open circuit. So it's, I think it, it, once it's loaded, it's about 9 volts, 9.9 .9 something volts, and it's about 500 milliamps. And so I think that's limiting some of the traces I got. I was just lazy, lazy. I should have done this with a proper power supply, but I just want to do something quick and dirty and just demonstrate how the transistor tracer works. So here's our beloved uh, uh, 2N3904. So here's the IC versus beta. IC along the bottom, beta along the y-axis here. So if you go to the data sheet, it's showing HFE, which is the same as beta. And at 10 milliamps, we should be seeing somewhere between 100 to 300. This is, this is minimum, typical, maximum. So we should be seeing between 100 to 300. Now, because the resolution, I don't have, uh, you know, very fine resolution, I'm not able to see exactly 10 milliamps. I think this is showing about, uh, I think it's about 80 milliamps or 60 milliamps. I'm seeing around 200. I'm seeing a beta of around 200, which is right smack dab in the middle there. So it's not bad. It looks like it's, uh, it's tracking very well. So at a... Uh, collector current of 50 milliamps. I'm seeing a beta of 260. The data sheet says I should see a minimum of 60. It doesn't give a maximum. It says a minimum of 660. It doesn't give a typical. So I'm seeing well above that maximum and it tracks with what these numbers are saying for the 10 milliamp. So it looks pretty good. At 100 milliamps, it should be lower than 50 milliamps and they're saying you should see a minimum beta of 30 we're seeing 190 and it's it's tracking so this is showing us the uh, the turn on for that pn uh, uh, base emitter junction here's the standard uh, trace that's showing uh, ib for each ib you're looking at uh, uh, VCE versus IC and you know you draw your load line put your Q and then you could figure out where you would go and bias your transistor 
I like using this chart better because this tells me what my minimum and maximum VCE range is I can use and what my uh, current uh, or what the maximum uh, VBE I can use. So I can use between here and here. So you put your Q point in the middle here and you know that as long as your transistor operates along this area here, it's going to be linear. So what's interesting, this is the Park uh, bench tester here, which is those component testers you get from China. You put in the uh, 2N3904 and it comes back and it says it's 432 beta of 432. And I think that's saying it's at 6.2 milliamps. It generates that. Well, this is saying your beta should be maximum about 300. That's really far out. These things cannot be trusted. I don't think you could take these values. Um, number one, it, it could be just that one single current but I've seen a lot of people say that these betas that spits out is completely ridiculous. And you can see, based on what the plots I've seen, that a 3904 should not get anywhere near 432. Uh, the beta we're seeing is much lower. So this is my time travel slide. I did this slide. Um, uh, I added this slide in because I added the RE um, plot. Uh, after I did this presentation. So I went back and I modified the presentation. And I put this in. So it's my time travel uh, slide. So um, so basically remember the RE here, once this junction is uh, reversed bias, no current flows across here. So you get a high resistance. RE is really large. So you get a really large resistance here. This is resistance along here and VBE along here. And so once you get to that threshold where you get that junction forward biased, that resistance drops and you get, uh, you know, conduction going across and you could see the, the, the resistance here drops very, very small. Now, RE is not given on data sheets. I haven't seen any transistor where they give that. Uh, to you. I see that uh, a lot of people calculate that. There's an approximation you could use based on IC and the, uh, the, the thermal temperature or thermal current or something or other. Um, so here's another amendment uh, on if you look at this slide here, you know, we weren't seeing this curving off. Uh, we weren't seeing it entering into sat saturation here. So with my uh, time travel slide here, what I found, and I only found this out like a day or two ago, as I was working on my version two of this, I realized that my trace limits were way too high. Here my VCC was set to eight uh, on the prior trace, and I wasn't seeing the uh, transistor go into saturation. Once I set my VCC to 1.5, all of a sudden I could see the transistor going into saturation there and VCE here is about 0.13 volts and here it's saying it should be about 0.2 volts uh, maximum. That's the maximum value. We're seeing 0.13 volts. We're below that. So it looks good. It's not uh, out of the question. And uh, you know part of the issue I've got here is with these plots is the resolution is uh, too large. So here, for example, here's the data coming out and you could see this is uh, IC versus beta. You could see the current here is jumping up 20 milliamps. Okay, so it's going from about 9 milliamps to 29 milliamps. And because of that large resolution, you can't really get to the 10 milliamps. So, um, and I can't really measure what the beta should should be at 10 uh, milliamps. So bottom line is uh, you need to fiddle with these ranges. And again, this is coming back to my comment I made uh, earlier about this is a tool. You have to know how to use the tool. And here's a classic case of where I wasn't using the tool properly. It's a mistake I made. So, you know, in hindsight, I now understand that I have to set the limits of these trace to measure what I'm trying to measure. 
Here's a 2N2222. I'm going to start going through these now a little bit faster. You know, beta 150 milliamps says should be 100 to 300. I'm seeing 190, so it looks good. You know, the VCE SAT is around, you know, between 1 to 0.3 volts, depending on the current. You know, here we're seeing it rolling off. It's about 0.9. This is maximum, so we're in good company here. So now I'm not sure whether this roll off here is an actual roll off for the transistor or it's a roll off because of the power supply I was using. And you'll see a classic case for that in a second. Here's the MPSH10, which is a VHF transistor. Uh, Kits and Parts sells this uh, uh, transistor. And I thought I would measure it and classic case again where I not using the tool properly. I didn't set up the sweep properly, so I can't see what the uh, beta is at uh, 4 milliamps. I got it here. This I think it's about 6 milliamps or 8 milliamps. It's coming out about uh, 90. It's coming out roughly about 90. It says it should be a minimum of 60, so we're not bad. We're not bad here. And here's the other, you know, standard uh, traces you would see with it. Here's a BC337. This is some random transistor I had in my parts bin. I just pulled it out, threw it up, looked at it. So at 100 milliamps, you should see 100 to 630. We're seeing 320. We're in good company. This is one parameter that drives me crazy. They talk about VBE on and they have VBE sat. Uh, for saturation, so I, it's confusing. I have no idea what VBE on versus VBE sat. Uh, at first, I thought VBE on was the VBE up here. I thought that's what they were saying, right? Which I think it it is. It's the saturation. Uh, so I think VBE on and VBE sat are the same thing. And uh, similar, we're seeing a. The uh, VCE sat about 0.7 volts, and if you look, it's curving off here, and it's about 0.7 volts, so looks looks uh, pretty good. Here's a 2219, uh, beta is 112 at 150 milliamps, so we're right in the middle here, we're good. This is trailing off, I'm not sure whether it's actually trailing off, but it looks to be about 0.9 volts, which is... Uh, you know, within the realm of uh, these parameters here. The interesting thing here is you start to see breakdown. You start to see the transistor go in, into breakdown here where the collector voltage is too high and the, uh, the transistor uh, is entering breakdown. And I've got a slide, previous slide, where I give a definition of what breakdown is. You can go back to that slide and take a look at that. So here is this, this transistor took me by surprise. This is a BD139. You see Charlie Morris using this transistor in a lot of his uh, amplifiers. Um, it's sold on kits and parts. So I got a bunch of them. I tested it and when I was looking at the beta, I got this wrapping around here. And I'm going, what the heck is going on here? Why is this coming back? So I did the IB versus beta, IB, this is IC, and it looks good, you know. Um, so I started thinking, scratching my head, going, what's going on here? Then it dawned on me that this stupid transformer I used, again, I used this transformer, I didn't use a proper bench power supply because I just wanted to generate these charts, you know, uh, quick and dirt, uh, dirty. It's 500 milliamps. Sure enough, look at this. Once it gets close to 500 milliamps, it does a, something wonky. So you can't trust this beyond like about 400 milliamps, for, for you know, 500 milliamps. So it's this transistor, it's this tra um, transformer here that's causing uh, the issue. And this, you know, underlines the, um, my comment before is you really have to understand what it is you're doing. Otherwise, you'd look at this and you'd go, oh my God, it's a bad uh, transistor. Chuck it out. So here's the actual BD139. Uh, Beta is 250 at 150 uh, milliamps. And we're seeing exactly 
250 here, not bad. And you make some other measurements there, blah, blah, blah. Here's a 30, 50, 170, should be 50 to 250. Here's the annoying part. You got VBE sat, VBE on. So they're both the same values. They're giving it different uh, ones at a collector current, ones at a, a um, collector uh, emitter voltage. So I don't know if that has some something to do with the meaning. Pro pro probably does, but they're both the same uh, voltage here. And uh, here's a 2N, uh, 2SC5706. This is a, a high current power transistor. Uh, uh, Kits and Part sells this uh, transistor. By the way, uh, in my schematic, I have replaced this TIP120 transistor and I'm using that 2SC5706 and it works perfectly fine. It works really, really well. So this is for the 2SC5706. Now, um, some of this I can't measure because HFE is measured at 500 milliamps and because of that stupid transformer I'm using, I can't get it, get it at uh, 500 milliamps, but I'm getting close to it. Around there, I'm getting about 280 for my beta, which is, you know, within here. So it seems reasonable. So now let's talk about MOSFETs. So I talked about uh, briefly about, uh, you know, beta, how beta is sort of like a transfer function. It's kind of like the transconductance for a transistor. But in a MOSFET, uh, they use this uh, this uh, parameter called G subscript M, which is the, the transconductance. So basically what this means is that you feed a voltage. The uh, a MOSFET is based on a voltage here being fed in. So once that voltage exceeds a threshold voltage, current starts flowing between drain to source and that the magnitude of that current that's flowing drain to source is dependent on that voltage and it's given it depends on this uh, g subscript m similar trace uh, so here you've got vgs versus id in a transistor this would be vbe versus ic except here we're looking at vgs versus id and uh, as you increase the voltage at some threshold voltage, current starts flowing across and your current goes up. It goes up quite rapidly. And then it gets to a point where you hit a maximum uh, VGS where it doesn't matter how much more you increase VGS, you don't get a uh, appreciable amount of current coming out. It flattens out. Now, the frustrating thing with MOSFETs the terminology is all backwards. They talk about this region being the saturation region and this region here called the triode and this is the cutoff region. Whereas a transistor, a BJT transistor, this is called saturation and this is called active. So it's a little bit uh, confusing. So but basically from this you know, uh, there's a threshold voltage and there's a voltage where you, you hit and uh, the transist the MOSFET goes into a uh, triode or ohmic, they call it ohmic or triode region. And the these curves, the uh, tracer generates these and you could see what that voltage is very clearly with the tracer. So here's the other uh, plot that I like, uh, generating same idea. You know, your VGS, uh, your your source here is with respect to ground. So VGS is respect to ground, blah, blah, blah. VDS is with respect to ground. You got the resistor. No, no current flowing through here. VDS is equal to, to, to VCC. Once current starts flowing, you hit your threshold voltage. Current starts flowing. There's a voltage drop across here. VDS decreases. More current through here, bigger voltage drop. The smaller VDS gets. So VDS gets smaller, 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 and you hit that uh, that threshold, and you go into triode mode, 
and VDS remains the same because the current here is pretty much constant. The voltage drop across here remains the same, so hence VDS remains the same and you go into this triode mode, triode uh, region, triode ohmic, this is the saturation region, this is where you get amplification. So a small increase in um, VGS yields a large difference in uh, uh, VDS. So here, in the terms of transistor, use beta. Here we use we have to use this. Uh, we have to use two parameters here. Once uh, one's uh, G subscript M, and the other one is this constant K. This constant K is a bunch of physical parameters about the MOSFET. So this is specific to the MOSFET, and it has to do with the way that MOSFET was uh, uh, constructed. And uh, that K uh, determines how much drain current you're going to get coming out given your uh, gate uh, source voltage and your threshold voltage. And you see it's a square term, it's a non-linear term. So it's not as simple as multiplying your voltage by K and you get that uh, current coming out. It's a square voltage. So the interesting thing here we could do, we could solve for K and we get K in terms of ID, VGS, uh, VT. I can measure all these using the transistor tracer. So I could plot K as a function of VGS or ID. And I do do that. And you do see, in fact, that K is a constant for that uh, MOSFET. So this would be a good way for you to um, uh, get similar MOSFETs so that you could compare two MOSFETs and you could determine whether that MOSFET is in fact, you know, the same, if that MOSFET is a fake, if it's a counterfeit. So this could help uh, do, do that. GM is, GM is very important and it's calculated this way. This is just K and uh, um, it's again based on VGS uh, and your threshold voltage. GM is important because that gives you the gain. If you look the voltage gain of a uh, common source uh, amplifier, uh, it's just GM uh, multiplied by your uh, drain resistor and your source uh, resistor, that gives you the gain. It's negative because it's an inverting amp. If your RS is zero, then this term becomes zero, and then your gain is just GM R RD. So that GM parameter is very important so you can understand the gain. So here's the uh, plots that uh, we can generate using the transistor tracer. Here's ID versus GM. Here's uh, VGS versus ID. Here's the plot where you could determine where your you're going into triode region. Here's your threshold voltage. Here's the standard plot, you know, that you get for VGS. Each one of these lines is VGS. And, um, you know, you're sweeping uh, VDS and uh, ID and you generate this. Again, you're seeing these gaps because the limits of my trace is just too big and I don't have sufficient um, uh, these deltas between these uh, VGS values is just too big and I need to reduce it and better uh, do a better sweep and I can get much more meaningful numbers. Here's a 2N7000 which is a very popular MOSFET and here we could see the um, transconductance here at uh, 200 milliamps is coming at 350 milli siemens so it's given in milli siemens here it's 0 0.350, again that's milli. So here it's saying that should be between 100 to 320. Uh, typical is 320, there is no maximum giving, so we're seeing about 350 millisiemens, so we're, we're, we're tracking pretty good here. We're, we're not too bad. So the other thing is RDS on at 500 milliamps, which I'm not getting anywhere near close 500 milliamps, we should be seeing a maximum of 5 ohms and typical is 1.2. We're seeing RDS is about uh, 4.8 ohms. So we're within here, but we're not even close to 500 milliamps. We're probably a couple hundred milliamps that this is being measured at. Now this chart is backwards. This is saying VGS on and VGS threshold should be re reversed. It's 
just again it's a mistake I made when I was generating this and I uh, determined that as I was doing these plots and I already did the plot so I was lazy I didn't want to go back change the code and redo the plot so these two terms have to be reversed in the actual production code now it is actually reversed so here you can see a threshold voltage of 1.3 when it turns on and uh, sure enough the threshold voltage is 1.26 which is 1.3 volts which is about right it goes into triode around 2.5 we're seeing that around 2.49 so 2.5 this is the saturation region this is where you get amplification so you plunk your Q right in the middle there or you do your load line here however you want to do it and you could uh, figure this out so if you look at the gate threshold voltage it's saying it's maximum 3 minimum 0.8 around 2.1 we're seeing 1.3 so we're we're somewhere in the middle here this could be a Chinese transistor a, a MOSFET so who knows that's why we're not seeing you know the typical 2.1 but it's still within the uh, the swing there the range here's a BS 170 you see Han Summers uses these a lot in his kits um, very popular it it's basically the sister transistor to the 2N uh, 2000 except it handles a lot more current and a lot uh, more uh, dissipates a lot more power I think it's about I think it's about 200 milliwatts or 300 milliwatts higher than a 2N7000 so here the uh, at two, 200 milliamps uh, you know you should be seeing 300 typical 300 no min max is given we're seeing 280 millisiemens so not bad we're, we're pretty good uh, RDS on at about 200 milliamps should be maximum 5 to 1.2 we're seeing 4.1 which is okay we're in the range here and uh, the threshold voltage is about 1.5 you know it said should be 0.8 to 3 we're in the middle here so we're about right and you can see right there sure enough it's turning on now what their definition is of turn on here I don't know because they give an idea of one milliamp so maybe turn on is at one milliamp and here we're not quite at one milliamp you know we might be you know at microamps so here's the IRF 510 this plots useless it's basically useless I, I don't even I should just take it out of the presentation but I'm just showing it to illustrate a point you know these data sheet parameters are at amps 3.4 amps the RDS on is at 3.4 amps I can't even generate 500 milliamps so the only thing I can really look on for these power MOSFETs is the turn on which says it's about 3 volts here it says it should be 2 maximum 4 so we're in the realm there that's good all of these other values I wouldn't trust these as you know as far as I could throw a stone here there's just random some other random power MOSFET I've got uh, had I found I put it I plotted it again you can't trust this because measurements are made at 9 amps and 10 amps you know I can't even generate 500 milliamps here so you know uh, the only thing we could say for certain is the threshold voltage which is about 3.3 and where's the threshold voltage here it's saying it should be between 2 and 4 and it's saying it's about 200 uh, 50 microamps so that's tracks about right 3.3 which is about right there here's uh, one of my favorite MOSFETs the RD16 HHF ones I bought a bunch of these and they're all counterfeits not even counterfeits they're fake they're they don't even work and uh, so I had a, a few that actually work they're great transistors there you see them using in the uh, BIDX you see people using these instead of the IRF 510s uh, they're really good because they're used they were used, used in CB radios uh, for the finals and CB it's up around you know the 10 meter up around I don't know 10 11 meters whatever it is but it's around you know 30 megahertz uh, and so these uh, MOSFETs are good up to that so we know that we could use them 
and the HF range for power amps. So the problem is with the data sheet, it doesn't even give you what the data sheet parameters are, it gives you charts. So now the interesting thing here is the chart, it starts at 5 volts. My maximum, my maximum VGS that I can feed this MOSFET is about 4.3, 4.4 volts. So I can't even get even close to, to this. And again, here it's showing amps. This plot is showing in amps. You know, again, I'm doing 500 milliamps, so useless. Um, you know, the transistor tracer is not very good for these types of uh, MOSFETs. So near the end, so here's the issues with version one. Uh, these sockets are terrible. I should not have used these sockets here in my version one. Again, this is the board I milled uh, to do the plots in this presentation. Uh, you know, I had to keep jiggling around and fiddling around to get transistors to work. I had to replace these occasionally. And the other thing is my supply uh, voltage to the collector. It's getting a lot, you're getting a large voltage drop. You know, you know, I'm seeing about eight volts, given that uh, uh, 10 volt um, transformer I was using, you know, I was seeing only eight volts. I was able to deliver, deliver, you know, less than eight volts coming out. Because I'm using a PWM to DC for the uh, base gate voltage and the circuits right here, it's right there. You could see the actual capacitor there. Um, it's limited to 4.3 volts and only a couple of milliamps. So, you know, that's the limitation here. It did work. This did work very good for a lot of the bread and butter uh, MOSFETs and uh, uh, transistors. It just uh, it's doesn't have enough power. So in version two, I, I'm going to use a ZIF socket. And here's the board I laid out for version two. I've got this board now. It just came from JLPCB. It's populated. I'm actually putting it through the ringers. Here's the new um, circuit that I use to generate VCC and VB. And with this, I can generate a lot higher voltage. The problem is this is extremely sens sensitive. And as well, because I didn't put in any emitter degeneration here, the current through these transistors wanders. And so the output here wanders. So you can't leave um, the, um, these transistors on for any length of time because you get the thermal, uh, not thermal runaway, but as this transistor heats up, beta changes and uh, bad things happen. So that's something I'm dealing with right now in version two. So in version two, you know, in theory, uh, you know, with 14 volts being fed in, I can get 11.1 .1 volts and 1.7 amps being fed to the collector drain for the device under test. And for the base gate, same thing with VCC, 14 volts. I can deliver the same voltage, 11.1 .1 volts, but I could deliver 22 milliamps. Uh, compared that to version one, which is 10 volts with a 14 volt supply and 930 milliamps. I'm getting, you know, a volt more and I'm getting much higher. Um, you know, I'm getting almost twice as much current. Uh, the big benefit is that I can use a lot higher um, voltages now. At the base, I can get up to 11.1 .1, and I can do 22 milliamps. So uh, just a couple more slides. Here is, is the uh, version one board that I received. I Al and Wayne have graciously volunteered to build this for me. So they're building this for me and I'm hoping they're able to test it. And if this tests and checks out and works out okay, this will be going to Dayton and will be shown at uh, club night at Dayton. This is version two. I'm not sure whether version two is going to be up and running uh, because as I said, I'm already running into some problems with the way that these transistors operate. Uh, I have to see if I can do something in software where I can accommodate that. But this board uh, may be going to Dayton, it may not be going to Dayton. So at that point, that concludes the presentation. And normally I would open this for questions. But uh, since I'm doing this on my own, and I'm just doing a capture here on my desktop, there are no questions.